I'm Jessica Brinkworth. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and I'm an evolutionary immunologist. I ask a really basic question, which is, why do people get sick? Expanded slightly more to why do some people get sick and some people don't? And so we use evolutionary and immunological methods to answer those questions. So coronaviruses are thousands of years old, but they have adaptations as a positive stranded RNA virus that are billions of years old. So positive stranded RNA viruses have been around a long time. Their precursors have been around for a long time, and they have like particular strategies that make them extremely effective at infecting and surviving the opening immune attack inside a cell. Coronaviruses themselves are not super old. They're a couple of, they're, they're hard to date, but they're, they appear to be a couple of thousand years old. They're widespread in mammals and birds, um, but bats represent a mammal where coronaviruses just seem to really diversify within and travel very far distances. And that's where SARS-CoV-2 very likely came from. Its closest known relative is from a, a horseshoe bat. I believe it's from the intermediate or the lesser horseshoe bat. So if you ever get to feeling that you're kind of small, tiny little creature has just come, and a tiny little virus from that creature has just radically changed the world. <laughs> all of your cells are outfitted with immune factors, all of them, because the cell is like a fantastic energy resource and everybody wants a piece. So cells have evolved to have all of these like immune strat uh, tactics um to attack you know incoming microorganisms and so one of the biggest problems when you're a virus is that you have to hijack the molecular machinery to you know replicate and in between when your genome is unsheathed wherever it's going to exist and by the time you get to make the first rounds of virions coming out like your baby viruses there are all these factors inside that cell they want to eat <laughs> they want to eat that genome of yours they want to take apart all of the pieces one of the things that makes positive stranded RNA virus is really powerful and COVID specifically is that when they come into a cell, their genome is already organized in such a way that it can be immediately translated by host machinery just in the cytoplasm. So it doesn't have to like get to the nucleus. It doesn't have to read itself into your genome. It can do it in the cytoplasm and it looks just like host messenger RNA because it's chemically altered to look like that. So your, your machinery that replicates um, or that translates uh, RNA, you know, to make proteins that DNA is dictating, that machinery ribosomes, they receive this thing just like you made it. And it's, so that's just one of the many things, but that is one of the things that positive RNA viruses do. SARS-CoV-2, like a lot of other positive stranded RNA viruses, has enzymes that clean up any spare RNA that it's making while it's replicating itself so that it doesn't trigger off any like immune detection inside the cell because RNA itself is um, can stimulate immune responses. And uh, one of the other things that it does is that it uses structures in the cell to like make little pouches. They're called, the technical term for them is double membrane vesicles. And so in these little pouches, it's like a hidey spot to put stuff together. <laughs> And, and then those pouches are just more or less, they're modified, but they get shuttled out of the cells so that they, you know, the process is so slick and so elegant. And it happens like that. It's really fascinating. Omicron's interesting for so many reasons. It emerged in South Africa. It has about 50 mutations. 30 of them are occurring in the spike protein. These are these little club-like proteins that are sitting on the outside of the virus that are mandatory for uh, cellular entry into the host cell. So spike connects to what's referred to as the ACE2 receptor. This is an enzyme that also acts as a receptor. It sits on the outside of a, many different cells. Uh, and it binds to that 
and then we generally see fusion between the viral membrane and the cell membrane and then the virus goes in or the RNA goes in and things start for replication, right? What makes Omicron special uh, is that on an from an epidemiological standpoint, it had immediately um, a rate of infectivity of like 10, a rate of infection of 10. So like the R naught was 10, meaning that the average person going about their business with the Omicron variant was going to pass it to 10 people. Now to explain what, how like stunning that is, for Delta, which we consider to be highly transmissible, the R naught was 6.5. On average, they're gonna pass it to 6.5 people. The original um, strains were somewhere between a 2.2 to a 6. It's a little unclear. Most people, I believe, have settled on an R naught of a 2. So it was exponential, and an exponential rate of transmission is pretty serious. The flu is under 2. It's, it's like maybe 1.8. The annual flu is it's serious, but it, it's not um, exponential. So for Omicron to be 10 is wild. This is like level of transmission we're walking into a recently vacated room can lead to potentially to transmission right that's the that's how um transmissible it is but what's weird is that it's not really clear why that's <laughs> the case for all these mutations so um it's only slightly improved in terms of how well that spike protein binds to ace so to ace2 and so binding like that really matters, like how strong that binding is because viruses can get knocked off. It can lead to inefficient binding of the, or fusion of the membranes and, you know, um, so how well you bind as a virus to your receptor matters. Now, okay, BA2. So here's what's fascinating about Omicron in like so many ways. There's actually three in an Omicron family. They all appear to have emerged around the same time that they're about as different from each other as they are from Delta. So they've been expanding and changing for a really long time and they have a ton of these mutations. And this is such a, um, not unexpected, but just to explain, coronaviruses are pretty evolutionarily conservative. They have, a unlike most positive RNA viruses, they have a cross-checking enzyme that checks for accidental mutations before replication and you know corrects them. So um, so you know the fact that it's changing so quickly is not uh, an indication of the of high mutability of this virus because compared to other viruses, it's actually not as mutable. At least compared to any number of non-coronaviruses, but uh, but the sheer volume of cases, right? So given the sheer number of cases. So um, the stealth Omicron, the BA.2 is, uh, they're all labeled. So BA.2, 0.3, they're all labeled as variants of concern because they stem from Omicron, which is a variant of concern. They're so closely connected um, and they don't stem, sorry. They diverge from the same parent at the same time. So they're like brothers and sisters. Um, but it's uh, starting to, we're starting to see more of it and it's even more transmissible, but it's about the same virulence. <laughs> Which I think really begs a question of what do we really consider mild? So the opening papers on the novel coronavirus that were published um, between March and, and uh, May of 2020 um, out of China, but the team in Wuhan, talked about staging of um, cases in sort of four categories. And the first was asymptomatic, which for the first wave, we now believe was about 60% of all cases were asymptomatic. Um, and then the remaining cases could be split. So the remaining 40%, you could split them into mild, which was a self, sort of a self-resolving, self-limited condition that where you um, had an upper, uh, upper respiratory tract infection that was uncomplicated. And then pneumonia, which was pneumonia. <laughs> and then severe pneumonia, 
which was needing supplemental oxygen or ventilation. So those categories are actually really, really simple. And there's not a lot of space for recognition of people who don't have severe pneumonia but require oxygen supplementation versus those that have to be position prone and ventilated, which is a dangerous position to have to be in, right? Um, and we know that mild cases are the ones that are um, most likely, at least this is the way that it looks at the moment, are most likely to have post-viral not complications so much as post-viral syndrome, which is something we've known about for decades uh, with other viruses um, and is the most common explanation for things like chronic fatigue syndrome. How do you talk about a virus realistically, I think is really urgent. If it's really transmissible, and it's affecting most people mildly, your death numbers are still gonna go up because more people have it. Highest numbers of deaths that we've had in this like history of this pandemic so far by a mild version of this virus. So if you're super transmissible and you're mild and you're still, you're still abs killing absolutely high numbers of people, you know, it's incumbent upon governments to talk about this realistically. That doesn't mean you take off masks and it doesn't mean that you don't have vaccine mandates. It sure doesn't mean that you are deeply inflexible about leave and paid leave or you know all the things that protect people from you know transmission. You know, it, it means that you will also still have to have a conversation on the table about infrastructure changes in workplaces and in schools. I mean, schools every single day can be a mass spreading event. There's increasing evidence that this long COVID phenomenon can last anywhere from 30 days to more than a year. And it's a, the sequelae of symptoms. The sequelae are, is really funny. The groups of symptoms, um, they can be diverse. So just talking about what might happen after a mild to moderate infection. It's characterized by extreme fatigue. So lots of fatigue. The etiology is not really known, like why is this happening? Not really clear, but it can involve a whole bunch of other things. So extreme fatigue, there's um, a number of people that ended up with pulmonary fibrosis. So fibrotic tissue, stiffening of the lungs, because there was a big, bad lung infection, even if it wasn't bad, bad. A number of people come out with myocarditis. There's definitely cognitive issues around fuzzy thinking and an inability to focus. And this is being seen not just in adults, it's also being seen in pediatric cases. And in fact, going back a year ago, we had our first reports of like student athletes developing myocarditis after asymptomatic infection. So this is a virus that maims on the way out and there needs to be considerations for this. And it includes like ensuring that people can get tested, not just for safety, but because it lays down, um, you know, a record of what's actually happening. Then there's the people who get moderate to severe infections, right? So like pneumonia to severe pneumonia, Anyone who gets, who develops sepsis or um, other variations on severe COVID is at increased, significant increased risk of dying in the next year. So something like 60% of all people who get sepsis can look at another admission, hospital admission within the year. And most people won't live past five years. So that's really important. Like post sepsis syndrome comes with the, in, like some people are unable to dress themselves afterwards because of muscle wasting um, that occurs during ventilation and then just seems to go onwards. These severe infections reprogram bone marrow and make big alterations in how immune cells act after the fact. One of the upsides of long COVID, which is a tough, tough thing to say, but one of the upsides of long COVID is that it's making apparent now that even mild infections are reprogramming bone marrow too. So there's a, a small 
the growing body of evidence that for more than a year after COVID infection, we see changes in the proportions of certain types of white blood cells and their activities. We see certain components aren't around in as high of number, and some of them are around in much higher numbers for reasons that are difficult to discern. And that all of that means that the dynamics and energy put into like making cells have changed. So like exposure to this virus matters. It really, really matters. And so there needs to be at multiple levels of government recognition that that is the case and a means of ensuring that people are protected. And there are many epidemiologists who can comment on that, but roundly the approach has been mask mandates, vaccine mandates, who can get vaccinated, should be getting vaccinated, making those things available. Like I myself currently are having trouble getting KN95s that are not counterfeit. That shouldn't be the case, right? So there needs to be involvement. And we're really gonna have to have a discussion about what sort of public health care is gonna be available to people who are coming out the back end of this. There's been a lot of political signaling using misusing the word endemic. So just to be clear, a pathogen is endemic when levels are stable, whether there's outside inputs or not. So you don't need outside inputs rather to, to have it circulating. It's at this stable level. We have never been like that with SARS-CoV-2 ever. And in fact, SARS-CoV-2 is always growing in numbers because it spreads exponentially. And so therefore it cannot by definition be endemic. It will always be epidemic or in this case, pandemic. And so because of exponential spread, until that changes, you're not going to have the luxury of saying, well, this is endemic, you just need to get on with your life. So that's the, the very first thing that I wanna make sure gets out of the way. The second thing around, uh, around masking and, and vaccines and, and everything else, we know from SARS-CoV and we know from data on other coronaviruses that antibody levels against them after natural infection drop off very quickly. They drop off so that they're basically gone by year three. And that's just antibodies, which is an indicator of how many memory B cells you have floating around and what they're doing. But B cells are really, really important as our memory B cells for, uh, for tagging and identifying and getting rid of invading microorganisms. So if they're dropping off, it's really changing how your immune system is going to respond to the incoming pathogen or if it'll even see it. So given that, vaccines are always gonna be on the table, right? And even though we give, we develop a much stronger and better and higher levels of, of these memory B cells to the vaccine, we're already seeing these steep drop-offs. This is just the nature of dealing with the coronavirus. There's not going to be a basic level where it's just sort of chilling out until we have widespread continuing vaccination and other mitigation measures always in place. So rather than pushing for a normalcy that we can't reach, it would be really great if we thought the way that say human ancestors have as how am I gonna troubleshoot this problem, right? How the, the great thing about humans and an awful lot, there's other organisms that are, are great at this too, like fruit flies are great at this. And um, I hate to say this, but cockroaches and rats are also good at this. There's lots of pigeons really good at this. You adapt, right? This is the situation that we're in. Pushing back to prior habits that we know are going to lead to transmission is a non-option. It's one of the really cool things about these mRNA vaccines is that they're very elegant. Like there's some salty water and a, a couple of stabilizers that are commonly used in vaccines. There's the nanosphere that sits around the outside of the RNA, which is also pretty easy to make. Um, and that nanosphere is made out of uh, polyethylene glycol and, and some other components. It's all very inexpensive, but that's what's in it. That's it.
we're tired and exhausted and have the highest number of cases of any wealthy per capita of any wealthy nation. <laughs> like, so we're excelling at spreading this thing and delaying, um, delaying any sort of, I don't know, easing of it. And so uh, we can't, I would say that we can't rely on the virus to simply change to something that's going to be more mild. That's not actually gonna happen. The way that this works evolutionarily most of the time is that pathogens evolve to be more transmissible. The virulence is just about getting resources. So this is the way that it's gonna go. It's just gonna get more and more transmissible and we're gonna keep facing this problem. So without support from government agencies and without like real investment in employees and in you know safe schools, we're not gonna get there. Um, so that means that even if you do go to an outdoor festival, if you're not six feet away and masked from somebody, you're going to, you're going to be at risk. So what I would say is that we can keep towing the line around masking. I mean, you know, maybe we, you know, maybe the way this goes is that we end up with more comfortable and just as effective masks. That'd be great, right? I mean, like this is, these are the kinds of like minor adaptations that really matter at the end of the day, because allegedly the reason why so many people don't like wearing them is because outside of political ideology is because they're sweaty or you get like, I get creases. Yeah, I mean like, so these are the adaptations that are necessary, effective, but comfortable. This is part of dealing with a virus that is highly aerosolizable and extremely contagious. But I think it's good. I mean, who doesn't like to troubleshoot a problem? Right? There are plenty of people that are creative. We've got, you know, this country is filled with fantastic scientists and artists. There are ways to like get there. So, so I'm hopeful. <laughs>